Well, he told me I was a pinch hitter, and now I'm a pitcher, so I don't know if I can do both. It's very nice to meet you all. I, uh, I uh, took a couple notes, and I was trying to figure out should I stand there or sit, so I'll just toss the pages as I finish. I, I, uh, I try not to give the same talk twice, because I think it gets kind of old and it's kind of boring. So today I'm going to talk about thinking different. And those words, the first time I heard the phrase was when I interviewed Apple to join their executive team. I went out and met Steve. And he said, have you ever heard the phrase, think different? And I said, uh, I don't think so. And he said, well, that was our big manifesto when he came back to Apple in 97. And Steve had this idea that what makes you unique as a person is your ability to think. But if you can't think differently, you can't change the world. And so my message to each of you is to really, as you go forward, is to how do you think different? And that's what I'm going to talk about today, if that's all right. And uh, over the years, I've come to agree with Steve. If you really look at people that change the world, they do think differently. And so I'm going to talk about two people today, Steve and Bill, to try to make the case on how you think differently. Now, before I do that, though, I want to share a thought about us as people. I think we're basically a body and a mind. And for most of you who are great athletes who have won this Campbell Prize, which, you know, for your school or represent your school, you've relied heavily on your God-given athleticism, your body, to get where you are today, to create your opportunities. Does that make sense? You had a gift, which is your athleticism. You worked your tail off to develop it. And you use your mind a little less than your body. Condi talked about that, you know, the black quarterback. You didn't use the mind as much as you maybe will in the future. But you use the mind enough to become leaders, so you made choices. But as you go forward in life, and I know that now because I'm in my early 60s, you know, you realize your body's going to go a little this way, but your mind keeps growing and expanding. As Condi said, I, it's about who I'm becoming, not who I am. But as you do that, you want to really think about thinking differently. And, and Steve thought differently about everything. You know, the first time I met him, I'd come out to interview. It was a Monday night. He was late. We spent two hours chatting, and we talked about everything but work. And he talked about thinking differently. He talked about work, family, health, diet, religion, everything. What struck me more than anything, though, about Steve was how focused he was. You know, he was in the moment, but he only did, like, one thing at a time. He was binary. You know, he had bought a company in the 80s called Pixar after he left Apple. And the average movie studio at the time, this is in the 90s, would make 20 movies a year. And he'd have some great ones or not. And what did Pixar do? Steve said, we're going to make one movie a year. He goes, I can only make one great movie a year. And Pixar, almost every movie became a hit, a home run. When I was sitting there talking about joining Apple, I said, so how many products do we have? And we looked at the conference table, he said, four. Now, I come from Target. I was a, a leader at Target. We have 100,000 square feet. We have thousands of products. None of them, we have four. Well, I said, how do we build a store for four products? He said, just to sell a lot of them. And I said, okay, we can do that. He was incredibly focused. But we spent the whole time thinking, he said, if you to come to this job, you gotta be able to think differently. And I know you can because of what you did at Target. And I flew home and I thought about it, and I kind of shared that philosophy. I had never thought of the words think differently, but when I came out of Harvard Business School with Mark, you know, I, I, I had offers at like Goldman's M&A Group and Solomon Brothers, and I was gonna do the expected thing, but I kind of decided I wanted to be really good at something someday, and I would, to do that, I would want to start at the bottom. So I decided I was gonna be a retail guy. And my first job after at Harvard Business School was unloading trucks at a Mervyn store. But I kind of had this belief that most people go into retail, didn't go to Harvard Business School. At that time, there was a lot of females who would leave the workforce to go have a family. If I put my head down and did good work, I could get, you know, move pretty quick. But in every job I took, I said, the first thing to do is do what you're expected to do as best you could, but then spend 10% of the time and do the unexpected. And as I was flying back, I said, ah, oh, the unexpected, that's the thinking different part. I remember my first job when I unloaded those trucks. 
I figured out how to unload a truck in 30 minutes, which is really fast. And we would unload the truck and put it in the back of the house and get it organized. And then in the future, sometimes someone would take it to the floor to sell it. Well, my thinking different was, what if we unloaded the truck? We did it so fast. Let's take the merchandise to the floor, fill it in, and then bring back what was on the floor to sell it. Yeah, that was thinking differently. And today, that's how every retailer works. You unload the truck, the systems put it on the floor, and then it comes back. You can't sell it out of the back of the house. Right? I remember my next uh, job. Let me try to catch up. I've got a few of these, I think. Um, I, I uh, got promoted to run the cash wrap. You know, Harvard Business School at Thanksgiving run the cash wrap. And I remember sitting there in line doing this cash wrap, so I wrote a long 10-page paper. We got to get rid of the cash wrap. How do you get rid of the cash wrap? Well, I didn't do it back in 1984, but in 2008, the Apple store was the first store to check people out using an iPod without a cash wrap. You know? But that was the unexpected. It wasn't how do you check people out, how do you reinvent checkout. And today, we all pay with easy pay. I remember taking over the kids' area at Target. You know, a lot of you might have kids. There were little kids' sections and big kids' sections. And as a buyer, you got to pick all the best stuff and turn it well. But I had this idea, what if we got rid of little kids and big kids and just had one big kids department and went from 11 sizes and little and big to five and doubled the assortment? That'd be kind of cool. That would permanently change how Target sells kids clothes and make it better for families. Well, we did that. Today, Target's the only retailer that has one big kids department and Target's a better company for it. That was the thinking different. When I took over the home area, we were competing on products. Target had a huge competitor called Walmart, and Walmart was better at basics. They had lower prices. Target had fashion. Well, we did that. Our home was good, but I said, there's a third category. What if we did design? What if you have products that had the markup of fashion, but you never had to mark them down? Because a designed object could be fashionable 10 years from now. And we did the first ever design partnership in retail, you know, 20 years later, Target's called Target, <laughs> and the cover of their annual report says winning by design. But that's because, you know, I had the ability to think differently. So two weeks later, I flew back to see Steve, and he offered me the job. It was amazing. We talked two hours. He didn't need to do any references, and he hired me to come work at Apple. And that decision to come there at the time was pretty controversial. Target was winning. Apple was losing money. Apple had low market share, but I just shared this belief that even though you only have four products, if you could present them well, it would be great. So I learned a lot from Steve. Over 12 years working with Steve, you know, he taught me so much, but mostly how to think differently. Steve thought differently about how he led a team. You know, Steve spent time with just a handful of us. He was a very private person. He didn't know a lot of people at the company, but he got to know the people he worked with really well. I remember the first day I was on the job, or one of the first days, he said, what time do your kids go to bed? And I said, 8 o'clock. And he said, well, can I call you? I said, sure. Well, he called me every day for a year at 8 o'clock. Literally, 8 o'clock, the phone would ring. Hi, Ron, Steve. How are you? Good. What's up? Well, let's just talk. And, and he, I said, so why do you want to talk to me every day? And he said, uh, he said, I want you to know how I think. Because once you know how I think, you will never have to call me to ask a question unless you're not sure how I think. So he invested a year getting to know me, talking about every subject on the planet. And he was the best delegate I ever worked for. He paid a lot of attention to detail, but he invested the time to make sure the people that he worked with knew how he thought. That was interesting. You know, that was his management fly. And then he would float like a butterfly in when there was a problem, but most of the company he let go. He let Tim do the ops. Johnny Ives designed the products. I got to do the stores. You know, I learned that from Steve, right? Steve thought differently about everything. You know, he had this fat passion that if you design the hardware and the software, you could control the customer experience. Well, to this day, Apple is the only company that takes responsibility for the entire product. Think of your iPhone with iOS versus your Android phone operated by Google with your Samsung device. A big part of what makes Apple great. You know, when Apple made its first product that wasn't a computer, Steve wanted to make a music player. 
Well, I remember those executive team meetings talking about it. We said, Steve, music set players sell for $199 and they're a really small category. And he goes, tell me a name of a person who doesn't love music. He said, no one's made the right product yet. And Apple created the iPod. And that became the first product available to everybody that really put Apple, uh, put the stores on the map. When Apple created the smartphone, the iPhone, Steve wanted to make an iPhone. There wasn't a single phone good enough for Steve to use. A little secret, he never had a smartphone. He never had a cell phone. When I'd go to meetings with Steve, his assistant would say, Ron, have your phone available, he's gonna get a phone call. Because Steve wouldn't carry a phone, they weren't good enough. But when he made that iPhone, he wanted to do one without a keyboard, which people thought was heresy at the time. But Steve had the courage to do what he believed was right because he valued thinking differently. Apple created the smartphone, and that became the Apple we know today. As we did the retail stores, you know, we thought differently about everything, and Steve embraced that. You know, you think of these retail stores. At the time, there wasn't a technology store in a mall. We put them in shopping malls. Steve hated malls. There were people there. He'd have to talk to people. He never wanted to go to the mall. But he knew that if Apple was going to have a chance to win, we had to be 10 feet from a customer, not 10 miles. So we put stores in malls. We built big stores. You could fit all the products on a conference room table. Our stores were the size of this auditorium. You know, this is about 6,000 square feet, it looks like to me. That's a big store. But that enabled us to create a store that was different, right? We could devote half the store to owners. We could imagine ideas like Genius Bars and create a place where we dispensed advice and people wanted to come for technical support. We could have every product available to be tried. We didn't have to have inventory on the floor. We created a completely different store and the Apple stores, lo and behold, became the most productive stores in the world. But it's all because Steve was willing to think differently. He thought differently about how he managed people, he thought differently about how he uh, merchandised, how he did products. He thought differently about the press. Steve was a very private person. He rarely did an interview. He wanted to control the press. So he'd create these events called Macworlds. And once every four times a year, he'd have an event and he'd announce a new product. But everyone paid attention. It was free publicity. He didn't have to advertise because he created a moment when they announced a new product. And that became the way all these tech companies launched products with these big events. All of this is because Steve thought differently. An intensely private person with a very big public persona, right? So if you want to be great, you got to have the ability and the courage to think differently, but then do it. Can you imagine buying a movie studio and making one movie a year? What if it's not any good? That takes courage. You know, everything Steve did was trusting his instincts and doing what he believed was different, okay? Now, the other guy I want to talk about to make the case on what's different is a guy named Bill. And you're probably thinking, I'm gonna talk about Bill Campbell. This is the Campbell Summit, right? And Bill and Steve were absolute best friends. Absolute best friends. They used to walk every day together. Bill worked at Apple when he was young. Bill was on the board of Apple. Bill was with Steve the day he died. You know, Bill was extremely close, but I'm not gonna talk about Bill Campbell. You might think I'm gonna talk about Bill Gates, because Bill Gates was Bill and Steve. You think of those two. You know, they both came up in technology together. But the bill I want to talk is the bill of the moment. Who's the bill of the moment in the world today? Anybody have a guess? When you think of the name Bill, who do you think of this week? I think of Bill Russell. Isn't it amazing? When I've seen Bill Russell the last few years, it's like somehow in an all-star game, you see this tall guy with a silver beard, goatee, Kind of, who, who is that? He hasn't played a game for 50 years. He passed away last Sunday, and everything, you can't stop reading about him. I was driving on the 101 the other day, there was a digital billboard. It said, number six, not even the name, Boston legend, Bay Area bred. People driving the freeway, thinking about Bill Russell. What made Bill Russell so memorable at age 88? when he hasn't played a game for five decades. Like Steve, a very private person, not a big persona, but we all remember 
respect, admire him. It's because Bill thought differently. Think about it. This guy, I guess I don't need my notes. Um, Bill, Bill played 20 seasons on 20 teams from his junior and high school till he retired from the NBA. He won 16 championships. He was a winner. He won two California high school champions. That's hard to do in California. These are a lot of teams. He won his junior and senior with the San Francisco, you know, the basketball UCSF, won the NCAA title. He left his team and became captain of the Olympic team in 56, led the US to an Olympic basketball title. He then joined the Celtics late in the season because the Olympics ran over at the time. The Celtics had never won a title with their great coach, with their great guard, with their great team. But they won the NBA title the first year, Bill's rookie year. So what did he do? Well, he was obviously a very good athlete, but he couldn't shoot. He's like me. I cannot shoot a basket. I'm a good athlete. I played soccer here. I, I can't shoot a basket. Bill had a lifetime shooting percentage of 44%. 56% from the free throw line. And he's shooting you know, this far away from this tall. But what did he do? He reinvented how you play defense. He became the best defender in the world. Right? He would rebound. He'd score 15 points a game. He'd average 22 rebounds a game. He would block shots. They didn't keep the stat back then, but people think he blocked between 8 and 15 shots a game. Now, Bill didn't just try to rebound and block shots. He invented the fast break, these big outlet passes. So he would grab that ball and hit the outlet, and that's how the Celtics scored. And they became famous for moving the ball. But everyone gives him credit for inventing how to play a position differently. That was Bill. The Celtics called their defense the Hey Bill defense. Because what they would do is he would play man to man, take the big person, imagine Will Chamberlain, but anytime someone's got beat, they just yell, Hey Bill. And Bill was quick enough to go cover the gap, and if he didn't need to, get back to cover his man. They literally called the defense Hey Bill. But he thought differently about basketball. And he played in a very different way. You know, Will Chamber, Chamberlain came out three years later. Wilt was a lot bigger. Wilt was three inches taller, had 50 pounds on him. Wilt averaged one season 50 points a game. Wilt averaged 27 rebounds a game. But he never beat Bill Russell. When Wilt Chamberlain retired, he said, you know, if Bill and I changed teams, the Celtics wouldn't have been nearly as good. Bill intimidated Will Chamberlain. In the first time they played each other in the NBA Finals, Wilt outscored him by 81 points going head to head. The Celtics won the series four games to two. It's not about offense, it's how you get your team together. Bill reinvented defense, he thought differently. Now he also thought differently about how he interacted with fans and teammates, right? Bill grew up, as Condi said, you know, I, I heard her talk about the first African-American football player was like 1960. I think Jackie Robinson was late 40s, 50. Bill was one of the first black, you know, basketball players, 1956, right? He went into one of the most racist cities in the country, Boston. He had to play in front of all these white people. When he came out of UCSF, he has choice coming out of college. He had two choices. Like, I could go into retail or Goldman Sachs. He could go to the Globetrotters, which paid better, or he could play basketball. Because the Globetrotters, he'd be an entertainer. He said, I don't want to be an entertainer. I want to be an athlete. And as an athlete, I don't care about the fans. I care about my team. So Bill went through his entire career. He didn't sign autographs. He didn't do interviews. He didn't care about what people thought of him. He cared about winning and he cared about being a great teammate. And he was a great teammate. He was such a good teammate that we forget, in his 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th years with the Celtics, he was the player coach. They didn't have a coach. It was Bill. 
because he had earned the respect of his teammates. So he had to call all the plays and play, and they won the title two of those three years with him being the coach on the court. You know, he was seen as being this stern guy, but he said there was no better place for him than being in the locker room after a game. He said, I don't even think heaven would be as good, he wrote in his book. I loved my teammates, right? So he knew, was very intentional, intentional about what he thought. He was very intentional about what he thought, how he'd play the game, how he'd interact with teammates, how he'd interact with fans. It wasn't about being popular. It was about having integrity with what he believed was important. You know, it turns out his mom passed away when he was 12. He was raised by his dad here in Oakland. And one of the great lines his dad said, don't worry about being understood. Seek to understand. Don't worry about being understood. Well, that goes back to Steve. When I, I remember when I spent time with Steve, he said, nobody understands me. I'm always thinking further out. I can talk forever. Nobody gets it. One of my favorite moments with Steve is we were opening our first flagship store, big store. You know, it was in Soho in New York, the original post office, uh, Station A. And uh, it, we were opening the day after one of these Macworlds in New York. And we had a Macworld event. And Steve was telling about how the company's going to do. And he shows up at the store opening. We open early, 8 o'clock in the morning. It's really sad. It was the first store opening. Nobody came. There were only 50 people there. And the press had been really tough on Apple. There's nothing there. And Steve walked in. He goes, where are all the people? I said, I don't know. He said, nobody cares. I should just quit. He goes, nobody cares about our stores. Nobody cares what we do. He said, I should just quit. I said, Steve, why don't you hang out for a while? He goes, no, I'm going to go. He just left. You know, he didn't stay for He went back to the hotel. And that was really sad, you know, kind of a tough day. And then around noon, people started pouring into the store. And I said to my person at the counter, this was before we had the shopper track, how many people are coming? He goes, there's 1,000 an hour coming in right now. It's pretty good. So I called Steve. I said, Steve, you've got to come back. He said, why? I said, just come on back. He said, no, I'm having a bad day. I said, come on back. So Steve came down to Soho from Midtown. He got there about 12.30. We stood on the second floor bridge of that store till 8 p.m., seven and a half hours. He just soaked in all these people loving what he created. Right? We had 8,000 visitors that day. I just didn't realize nobody gets up early in New York. This is not Condi time. This is New York time. You know, but they came. But when we were sitting there, Steve said, you know, my whole life, nobody understands my vision. He goes, I don't care what others think. All I care is what I believe is right. That was his conviction to thinking differently, right? And so that's the thought I have for you. You know, you're going to now go off and do great things in your career. You're going to move from depending primarily on your athletic gifts to really what you can do with your mind. But I do think if you really look out, the people that truly changed the world had the courage to think a little bit differently, right? And that's what we need today, because in this world we live in, especially here on campus, you know, I was a trustee, there's this cancel culture. If you think differently and speak your mind, you, know, you put yourself at risk. This isn't a good thing. We gotta encourage people to bring their perspective, their point of view, their background, their unique gifts, and use their mind to think differently. And I think then you'll have a great career because you'll never be conforming. You'll truly be creating, if that makes sense. All right, that's my thoughts. There we go. Thank you.